Hello, I'm Dr. Ken Landa. Thanks for watching. Let's talk about hemorrhoids. They're the most common cause of anal symptoms and one of the most common of all gastrointestinal conditions. People incorrectly attribute almost every condition in the backside to hemorrhoids, but they're very common. About 1 in 20 people right now has hemorrhoids or complains of hemorrhoids. They're going to cause more than 4 million office visits or emergency room visits this year. And it's estimated that about three out of every four Americans will develop hemorrhoids at some point in time. Hemorrhoids that become increasingly frequent after middle age. Well, a significant number of people don't go see the doctor because of fear or embarrassment or lack of knowledge, but hemorrhoids are actually normal structures in the anal canal, and we only give them the name hemorrhoids when they become swollen or inflamed or thrombosed, but they're normally there. They're as common in men as in women. Some suggestion more common in Caucasians. They peak in women during the years of pregnancy. And then again, after age 45, they were first reported in 1700 BC. It was said at that point in time, we'll put a little liniment on the hemorrhoids. 400 BC, Hippocrates said, I'm going to tie a string around them. They were mentioned in the Bible. They had their own patron saint in the 6th century. 1398, they used the term hemorrhoids for the first time. It was said that Napoleon didn't participate in the Battle of Waterloo because he had thrombosed hemorrhoids, and hemorrhoids in 2012 were the most popular health care search term on Google. Their normal structure, as I mentioned, in the anal canal, they're sort of an erectile tissue. They're sort of reminiscent of the tissue of the penis, but they're actually anal cushions underneath the surface of the mucosa. A study recently evaluated whether people could make the correct diagnosis of their own hemorrhoids. And unfortunately, the answer is no. A lot of people who thought they had hemorrhoids didn't, and a lot of people who did have hemorrhoids actually thought they didn't. Well, the diagnostic, diagnostic accuracy of doctors isn't necessarily all that great. It's less than 50-50 if you see the family doctor or the internist. It's about 70%, 75% if you see a surgeon. Now, hemorrhoids do not increase the risk of developing anal cancer, colon cancer, but they can have some of the same symptoms, especially the bleeding, the bleeding that can drip into the toilet bowl or be present on the toilet tissue or be on the outside of the stool. The complications of hemorrhoids well, they could become strangulated. You could have chronic blood loss and develop anemia. You could have a blood clot or infection or fecal incontinence. Could develop a very painful condition known as an anal fistula. Could have irritation chronically of the tissue around the anus. Could have some ulceration. The diagnosis isn't necessarily all that easy, especially early on, especially for internal hemorrhoids. Visual examination obviously can detect some external hemorrhoids, but oftentimes not the internal hemorrhoids. Digital examination actually is often unhelpful. We can use a side viewing anoscope and have the person bear down, and then sometimes we can see the prolapse of those early hemorrhoids. A person might need a little more extensive evaluation, especially depending on the age and the duration of the symptoms and the nature of the bleeding that they have. Might need a colonoscopy, especially if they have a history of a change in bowel habits or a history of polyps or colorectal cancer. It's said that people less than age 50 don't usually need an evaluation, whereas people over age 50 are more likely to have colon cancer, so they need more intensive screening. But that's not necessarily the case because unfortunately we're finding colon cancer developing in people in their late 30s and even in their 40s. What precipitates a flare of hemorrhoids could be chronic constipation, but even more commonly it's chronic diarrhea. They frequently develop in the second trimester or even third trimester of pregnancy, frequently return to normal after delivery. They're common in people who perform heavy lifting at work people who are obese, people who overuse laxatives or enemas, or spend too much time on the toilet reading, people who sit for a long time, people who don't consume enough fiber, age, just being over age 45 is a major risk factor. Straining on the toilet, anal intercourse, increased abdominal pressure because of an abdominal mass, or fluid accumulating inside the abdomen, or pregnancy. Now, the evidence for some of these really is lacking. 
but we do know that irrespective, pregnant women are at high risk, people who are obese are at high risk. We don't know so much about the fiber and some of those other very commonly discussed features that supposedly predispose a person to hemorrhoids. Actually, the hemorrhoids themselves contain blood vessels. They contain arterioles and venules and connective tissue and elastic fibers and muscle. We can classify them, classify them in various ways, internal hemorrhoids and external hemorrhoids, small or large, prolapsed or irritated. Well, we divide them internal and external depending on where they happen to be inside the lower intestinal system. So if they're above the area where the colon mucosa meets the skin mucosa, well, that's an area where we don't have any sensation. Those are internal hemorrhoids. If they're below that line, if they're covered by skin instead of colon mucosa, then you can have pain, just like you can anywhere else on the skin, and we call those external hemorrhoids. Internal hemorrhoids are more common. They're inside the rectum. They're soft. In the early stages, you can't see them. You can't feel them, even with a digital examination. Early on, they rarely cause discomfort. They don't prolapse until a little bit later on. Prominent more so when a person strains. That can irritate them. Oftentimes, it pushes them through the anal opening. The prolapsing hemorrhoids are the ones that become irritated and painful because of a spasm of the anal sphincter complex. Actually, about 20% of the people who have symptomatic hemorrhoids also have what we call an anal fissure on the backside of the anus. That's commonly the problem when severe pain is persistent, even though a person doesn't have any thrombosis. Usually, early on, there's no visible abnormality with internal hemorrhoids. It's only when a person strains that they protrude, and when they do that, they can collect some microparticles of stool and some mucus, and that can cause irritated skin, itching skin, a sensation that you can't completely empty your bowels. You continue to wipe. You irritate the skin further. And it's unfortunately a relatively common situation. Oftentimes, there's some bleeding. Now, the stool itself can be normal in appearance. It's not the dark, black, tarry stool that we would see with a peptic ulcer, a stomach ulcer, or even a colon cancer on the right side. It tends to be more bright red blood. It's bright red blood that either coats the outside of the stool, isn't mixed with the stool, or is present on the toilet tissue, or drips freely into the bowl. There are three hemorrhoids, actually, that develop. One on the left side, two on the right side, right front side, right back side. They were graded, the classification scheme, by a doctor only as recently as 1985. Grade one hemorrhoids were small. They're just inside the anus. They're not visible. They don't prolapse. They're just prominent vessels or sinusoids, and a little bit Further on, they can protrude, but they protrude like a little small polyp, typically when you're having a bowel movement, but they return spontaneously back inside the anal canal. A grade 3 hemorrhoid is a prolapsed hemorrhoid that appears outside the anal canal. It tends to occur while you're having a bowel movement, and you have to manually reinsert it feels like a little grape or something that's hanging there. And in type 4 hemorrhoids, or grade 4 hemorrhoids, you can't push them back. They remain large. They remain outside. Those are the ones that can, unfortunately, suffer the thrombosis and the strangulation. But the grading system doesn't include consideration of size or discomfort or bleeding or a change in your daily activities. Actually, sometime, in order to make the correct diagnosis of a hemorrhoid, you really need to take a selfie and then take it over to the doctor because it's not present when you get to the doctor. It's one of those typical things like your car. When you take it to the shop, it's not making the noise. Well, the external hemorrhoids occur under the surface of the skin at the edge of the anus. They're just outside the anus. They're right at the edge. And when they're irritated, they tend to itch or bleed and they typically become painful. A painful area tends to suggest either external hemorrhoids 
or the anal fissure. Well, if we're talking about the external hemorrhoids, you can have them without having any kind of symptoms, and when they resolve, they can leave a little mass outside the anus. We call it a skin tag. And you can have combined internal and external hemorrhoids. It's bright red blood that tends to occur, not the tarry blood. It's very common, but bleeding in anyone over age 40 or 50 needs to be evaluated, perhaps superficially, perhaps more intensely. The symptoms of hemorrhoids could be itching of the anal area, we call it pruritus ani, or it could be discomfort or irritation of the skin. A person could have some rectal pain, some swelling around the anus, difficulty cleaning after a bowel movement, leakage of feces, some people feel like they haven't completely evacuated their bowels after they have a bowel movement. Some people have an ache when they're sitting. The tissue can become friable and a person can have soilage or seepage or irritation. If they're large, you can have difficulty with hygiene. When they're thrombose, they can thrombose either spontaneously or it can be precipitated by physical exertion or straining because of constipation or maybe because of a bout of diarrhea or maybe just a change in your diet. When thrombosis occurs, a person develops the pain and the swelling, the inflammation, and you feel a hard lump on the outside. Obviously, it's near the anus. It's very uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable, especially when you change positions, when you're sitting, when you're wiping. The skin can become eroded. Typically, the pain peaks during the first 48 hours, and then it tends to spontaneously subside. It's going to take it about a week to 14 days to totally subside. Now, the blood clot isn't like the blood clot you could get in your leg that could travel somewhere else. The recurrence rate, if you have a thrombosed external hemorrhoid, is about 50%. If they're very early and very uncomfortably, they can, uncomfortable, they can be incised and drained, but typically, after 48 hours, they start to resolve by themselves. Now, when they're there, they can cause irritation and pain, of course, difficulty with hygiene and itch. Not all masses, not all lumps, not all symptoms around the anus are due to hemorrhoids. They could be due to an abscess or the anal fissure. They could be due to anal warts. Rectal prolapse, herpes can occur around the rear end. You can have cancer of the colon, cancer of the rectum. You can have a dermatitis or skin tags or muscle spasm that can lead to pain, the levator ani syndrome. Or you can have a very peculiar condition that we call proctalgia fugax, where you have a second or two seconds of intense pain and then it just disappears. Pathologically, well, we often refer to them as varicosities, like the varicose veins you get in the leg, but they're not really. It's sort of like the cheek. The cheek of an individual is nice and smooth when we're young, and as we get older, they sort of tend to sag and we get the jowls. That's pretty much what happens inside the colon. The tissue tends to prolapse, the tissue that's composed of arterioles and venules and anastomoses between the two, the communications of the arteries and the vein, we call it the sinusoids, and the smooth muscle and the connective tissue. Now, it's a normal structure, as I mentioned, and it supports anal closure. It helps maintain continence so that you don't leak. It's very important that these hemorrhoidal cushions actually prevent leakage when you cough or when you sneeze or when you lift heavy objects, actually they amount for about 15 to 20 percent of the closure pressure at rest. Well, we can damage these with hard stool or frequent stool or excessive straining and all of that over a period of years leads to a vicious cycle and the vicious cycle ends up causing us either internal or external hemorrhoids. Now, the treatment for the condition. Uh, we don't really know what the best treatment is. There are millions of visits, as I mentioned. There are probably going to be 300,000 hospitalizations every year because of hemorrhoids. More than 100 different remedies that you can buy on Amazon. But they're of dubious validity. All but the most stubborn of cases, however, will avoid surgery. The surgery that was very common 20, 30 years ago, not all that common nowadays. You can benefit yourself by an appropriate diet. You can 
make sure that you don't have hard stools, you can make sure that you don't suffer from constipation, you can appropriately evaluate the situation, add some fiber to the diet. We typically have about 15 grams of fiber. 30 grams is really what's suggested. Eat your broccoli, eat your beans, have the whole wheat, have some fresh fruit. Make sure you get sufficient amount of fluid. Don't spend more than a couple minutes on the toilet. Don't use irritating toilet tissue. You can moisten it. You could use some alcohol-free baby wipes. You could supplement your diet. Maybe you take some psyllium or some metamucil, some citrusyl, maybe a stool softener like Colace. You don't wear clothes that are going to make you perspire so that the area becomes macerated. A sitz bath, if you have hemorrhoids, may or may not be helpful. It certainly is relaxing, but it's a nuisance. If you're going to use a sitz bath, either plain water or maybe a little Epsom salts, certainly no soap, no bubble bath. The topical remedies that we have, the local anesthetics, the witch hazel, the corticosteroids, the hydrocortisone cream, the barrier creams like Vaseline and zinc oxide, the medicines that constrict the blood vessels, the vasoconstrictors that you get in a decongestant, the medicines like pseudoephedrine, all of those are marginal at best. Whatever seems to help your symptoms, that's what you should do. Preparation H major seller, but minor evidence supports its use. It might be a little bit helpful for itching or bleeding or discharge. And there are a wide array of different kind of preparations, and there's really not great evidence for any of them, whether we're talking about apple cider vinegar, we're talking about aloe, or tea tree oil, or the flavonoids, or balsam of Peru, or Chinese herbal products, or coconut oil, or bromelain, or arnica. None of those really have been shown to be effective. Now, if your hemorrhoids are really a chronic nuisance and you need to do something, one of the simple things to do is rubber banding if they're internal hemorrhoids, if they're above that dentate line. You can have the grade 1 or grade 2 or sometimes grade 3 hemorrhoids treated with rubber banding, a technique that, as I say, goes all the way back to Hippocrates' time in 400 BC. But the modern treatment really began in the 1960s relatively few complications as long as we're above that dentate line, as we're, on, uh, as we're above the area where the external hemorrhoids do not treat the external hemorrhoids. This is not a treatment for external hemorrhoids. Well, sometimes you need a couple sessions, two or three sessions, and that probably is going to be sufficient. It's a relatively simple procedure to perform. Then we have infrared coagulation, which is even simpler Again, both of these are office or at most day surgery treatments. The infrared coagulation is somewhat less effective than the rubber banding, but for the first year or so, it's a quite adequate treatment for early hemorrhoids. There's less discomfort with this kind of a technique. It's quick, simple, no anesthetic needed. There's the older electrocoagulation burning, like you would a skin tag or something of that nature. That's a little bit more painful, a little bit more uncomfortable. And then we have sclerotherapy. The injection, pretty much like for the varicose vein of the leg, that can be accomplished. That's a still a very reliable technique, if performed correctly. So you want to make sure you see an experienced physician. There's laser therapy and radiofrequency ablation that are sort of experimental. They're not really standard therapies. Cryotherapy, one of the treatments, sort of like we would do for a wart on the outside of the skin, is definitely on the outs. It's not a procedure that is performed for hemorrhoids anymore. And then we have the old-fashioned surgery. The old-fashioned surgery is a procedure that can be done by an experienced physician, typically a colorectal surgeon, and the outcome is very good. Unfortunately, going from the surgery to going back to work, that can be a little rocky for several weeks. It usually takes two to three weeks to heal for that procedure. There aren't many complications if it's done correctly, but 
it will knock you out of the game for a while. So as a result, they experimented with some other techniques and they found that they could do something known as a stapling procedure. And they actually can staple the tissue right back inside the lower portion of the rectum. And it seems that that is quite effective when you put it back inside the anal area where it came from. It's a relatively simple procedure and it's sort of a little more advanced than the rubber banding, but it's extremely effective and it might take the place of the standard surgery. So something to consider. If you have any questions about hemorrhoids, let us know. Thanks for watching. I'm Dr. Ken Landau. Thank you.